Sorry, I'm stuck. And the bunker. Uh, this is Martin Herfurt, uh, who will introduce himself. Hi, my name is Martin. I'm with Salzburg Research Austria, and I'm mainly concerned about the presentation and demonstration today. So it would be nice of you if you switched on your Bluetooth, if you have it. So we have a little more statistics to show you in the end. <laughs> we won't uh, hurt you, honestly. Okay, today I'm going to go through um, some definitions of terms. I, I'm not sure Bluetooth's taken off in the same way over here as it has in the UK. Um, and then we'll look at the devices and the various attacks we came up with. Uh, the responses and defences from uh, the industry, and by defences I mean not how they defended against the attacks, but their defensive position. Um, some legal issues arising out of uh, this whole stuff. It's not a simple as, you know, that it's illegal. Um, it's quite interesting, some, some of the, the legal stuff that comes along. So we'll just go straight into that. I'm sorry. Uh, is that better? Okay, so Bluetooth is uh, basically a wireless replacement, a uh, wire replacement technology. It's designed to get rid of all the crap that, that you need to connect all your devices together. Um, it's low power, short range. It uses the same um, frequencies as Wi-Fi and the data rate's um, about one megabit. Uh, it's owned, the, the, the trademark Bluetooth is owned by the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, uh, who are a trade association, and they basically license um, the IP and uh, the, the trademark. Now what's nice about that is you can go and join as an individual the, the, the SIG, and that gives you the right to use the, the logos and the trademarks so if you were to release um, some kind of useful tool, for example, you could have the SIG stamp of approval on it, which is nice. Um, other people get to pay, you know, the bigger members who are actually making Bluetooth devices have to pay um, various fees to get their devices qualified. There's two websites, the uh, Bluetooth.com is the consumer site and uh, Bluetooth.org is the technical site where you can go and sign up as a member. So the three issues that have come up recently are bluejacking, blue snarfing, and blue bugging. Um, bluejacking is a bit of a misnomer. I mean, it, it sounds like someone's hijacking your phone, taking it over. What they're actually doing is just sending you harmless messages. Um, of course, like any good new technology, it's immediately used um, for the pursuit of sex. So. This thing called Two Thing has come along, which is basically setting up casual liaisons via Bluetooth messaging. So people sitting on trains or in airports waiting, they're bored waiting for a plane, um, they'll send each other a message, and uh, if they like the other you know, guy or whatever, they'll um, go and do something. Yeah. So um, because of bluejacking, the, the, the fact that you're visible makes you uh, vulnerable to blue snarfing, which is the, the thing we discovered back in November. Um, and basically, we just took the, the um, sort of geek slang snarf to, to steal um, or take an unauthorized copy of some data, stuck it with blue, so you get blue snarfing. And uh, what that gives you the capability of doing is copying data, uh, your phone book, calendar, uh, IMEI, which um, the GSM networks doesn't mean very much anymore. It's the unique identity of your phone. But uh, I guess on, on networks where you don't have a SIM card, it might still be um, useful for cloning. Uh, if you've got images associated with entries in your phone book or your calendar, then we get those too. Um, blue bugging was uh, discovered by Martin when he was trying to reproduce my work at uh, CBIT. And basically, he wanted to... Um, see how, how big a threat this was in the real world. And so, but because I hadn't published any of my data, he had to independently discover it. So um, he discovered how to do it, but actually found some more problems as well. Uh, and then we teamed up and have done some interesting things since then. Now, using uh, his attacks, we're able to actually take full control of the telephone, um, make calls, read and write your SMSs, your text messages, as well as the, the calendar and, and uh, phone book entries, um, and send SMSs and, and set diverts. Okay, so the devices we've looked at on the whole are mobile phones. Uh, and the reason we looked at those is 
because, well, my job as security officer for the bunker, you know, my job is to, to protect my perimeters. And um, what I was finding is those perimeters were actually becoming wider and they were leaving uh, my building um, because they, you know, network of, uh, or gateway of last resort for my sysadmins, for example. Um, they have GSM mobile phones. They want to be able to dial in from anywhere. So, you know, they have potentially set up uh, gateways into the network. Um, the, the sales teams have all of their um, contacts in their calendar entries, uh, you know, appoint business appointments and so on. So there are potentially a lot of issues with allowing staff to use um, network-enabled phones. Um, and in particular, uh, it was becoming something they needed to do because the law changed in the UK uh, to do with using mobile phones while driving. Uh, it's now no longer legal to actually hold the phone to your ear while you're driving. You have to use a headset of some kind. So Bluetooth is a good um, solution for that. Now, over in Europe, um, there's absolutely massive take-up. Um, there's two million devices per week uh, worldwide, but I think most are entering the market, and I think most of those are over in Europe. Um, and in fact, if I go out in London, it's pretty much impossible to get out of range of a Bluetooth device. If I scan for, for Bluetooth, I will find something no matter where I am. Um, and Bluetooth SIG are, are claiming that by next year, 30% of all new phones released in the States will have Bluetooth. So when we first publicized this, um, the responses, or when I talked to people about it, the, the general public response was usually, well, I don't care. There's nothing special in my, my phone. You can have my address book. Um, but in practice, if you go and look at what's in your phone, you'll probably find there's a few entries in there that uh, you might not want the whole world to see. Uh, and when everyone I've challenged on that, I've actually gone and, and they've let me pull data off their phone. Um, we have found stuff like that. So uh, a friend of mine who's a, a coffee shop manageress, um, I read her phone book and I found the, the full street addresses of three coffee shops plus the door codes and the alarm codes. So, you know, she didn't care when I first told her. It wasn't a problem, but actually it probably is a problem. Um, and Bruce Schneier's comment on this was... Um, the people are treating their phones as kind of data wallets now. They, they, they believe that they're secure, so they put a lot of stuff in there. And they believe that, uh, you know, if it, it's a device you carry around with you. If you don't lose it, you, you can't lose your data. So clearly with it, this technology, you can. Um, second response is, well, you're supposed to enter a password or something. So, yeah, well, that's the whole point. You are supposed to, but we're bypassing that. Um, but people kind of dismiss it because they believe the industry um, claim that it's secure. So you're telling me it's, you can get in, but I know you can't because I have to pay, so I'm not going to listen. Um, and finally, you're selling a fix. Okay, well, we can't fix it. The, the, the mobile phone companies need to fix it. This is closed source proprietary technology. We can't just go in with a fix and say, okay, we've taken your stack and we, we've um, fixed it. So. This is something they have to do. But even if that were true, you know, you can be as cynical as you like, but you still have a problem. Okay, the specific attacks, which Martin will demonstrate. Um, snarfing, uh, we can steal the calendar appointments, um, some images. We won't do that now because it, it's, it's too slow. Um, your phone book names, addresses, numbers. Um, as I've said, you can get pins and other codes out of there if people have put them in there, and um, SMS text messages. Uh, the other attack is actually probably more serious, is turning a phone into a bug. Because we can initiate a call, what we can do is connect to your phone, tell it to call us back, and then we have an open mic on your person. So you're walking around doing your thing and we're listening to everything you say and that's now coming over the network so we don't even have to stay in range anymore um, because it's a GSM call. Um, the other method of bugging is we could set up a man in the middle attack where we change an entry in your phone book so your office entry no longer phones directly to your office. What it does is it phones my um, gateway which then phones your office and we have both sides of the conversation. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, the organizers here suck, so we're going to have to change cables. I'm supposed to have a video switch. Now, when 
we tried to do this over at uh, Black Hat, uh, somebody dosed the phone we were going to attack and was bluejacking it. So I don't want to worry on Julie, but I think there might be a hacker in town. So. <laughs> Maybe. Have you broken it? No, it's fine. <laughs> so, as I was, some of you already attacked our Nokia. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, which you see in the right-hand corner of the of the screen, it's an uh, insecure phone. But what we is ours. It's uh, totally untouched so far. We didn't uh, uh, modify anything, but we have to do that for legal reasons. Just bugging a phone, which is ours, which we had for, have for this. And hopefully it's working. <laughs> so we try that. You know, in the, so this is not how it is supposed to be in the wild. People are passing by. Is it working? Okay. No, try it again. It? I'll try it. <laughs> so if this move on to the next demonstration we have about the Nokia phone book and SMS. So we move on and try this again later. So we have another script on there which is called GSnarfy. It's both using the Gnaki uh, application which is um, for Nokia phones and it's a f uh, it's even having a X front end, which makes it even nicer to work with. So uh, it said connecting to Charger. Charger is the name of our machine. We called it this way because people would get uh, maybe some, uh, you know, they would get some funny ideas of what is going on if there is something else than Charger. So the only indication we see there is a little headset symbol on the display. Uh, it's, it has not made any sound so far, so people won't know if it's in the pocket. And even if it's not in the pocket, they won't know what's going on. So what happens next is that I open up the contacts, reading them out from the phone. So it's reading the phone memory and the SIM memory. In fact, there are some more phone books to read out. It's about the dialed contacts, missed contacts, and stuff like that, missed calls. And, and that's just the stored phone book information, which is enough to play with in the end. So what you see here is just a list of the phone. We just kind of obfuscated the numbers, so you won't have anything of them. <laughs> and I'm looking for a specific entry called Honey. So this is supposed to be the girlfriend of or the, the boyfriend of the owner. And I'm sure you know those. Oh, you can see it anyway. Wait. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what we're going to do. So, taking that out, modifying the entry, which is done with that little icon. So we have the honey, and we just modify the number, which we have on here. <laughs> oh, other way around. <laughs> 702. So maybe you want to copy that number. That's only 47 bucks, I believe. <laughs> yeah, it's cheap. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Don't forget the one. So, it's a plus one or one? I think it should work. It's right. Okay. How do you know it's right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, this is used to save it to the phone again. So, we, we changed that number of the honey. So, anybody calling honey will probably call somebody else. You know, if that number would call the person, honey would show up. So, but if the person is intending to call the entry with honey, so it will, the person will call this number on here, right? 
But yeah, if you examine the entry, you will see that number. So now this thing to do is... Agent X, don't leave the room, please. Phone's okay. still there. Yeah, our, okay. our bug is still here. Stay there, it's okay. We'll try it later. So whatever. SMS messages, we can read them out of the phone. It makes it... You, you probably could have your own application doing that, but it's PDO encoding of the messages, so we use G Naki again for, for reading that. So what you see here are the stored SMS or the received SMS messages. And we could also use the phone in order to send SMS messages without even, you know, knowing uh, of the owner. The only time the owner gets to happen that this happened, uh, gets to know that this happened is when he re receives the bill and maybe there's some premium service numbers also on it. <laughs> right. So when we disconnect from the phone, you see it again in the, the display. We disconnected from the charger. And you didn't hear that. The phone emitted a beep. So people probably would look to the display and would see, OK, I disconnected from the charger. So what I'll try now is, again, to blue bug our, our test device, which has nothing to do with the Nokia phone here. So it didn't work out so far. Hmm, that's what happened. So no bad response. It's supposed to be dialing a number. You know, what we did is just, as Adam explained before, calling the phone, which is here on the table. But it's not ringing, so I'll try it again. You know, this, this is a little embarrassing. <laughs> So no reaction on the display. So it's supposed to work, <laughs> usually. Anyway, we could bug this phone. Haven't got the voice channel on that. No? Okay. <laughs> okay. No, with the Nokia, the attack profile is slightly different. We um, would have to set up the Bluetooth to capture the, the um, headset profile. On the Sony Ericsson's, we just get a straight open mic. Um, back through to this phone. But basically, if this had worked, what you would get is um, the goon that's holding that phone would be walking around with an open mic and he could go out and leave the room, get in a cab, go to the other side of town, and that GSM connection would keep working and we would hear everything that's going on around him. Um, and in fact, that um, connection could be anywhere. So we could just be local operatives setting up the, the bug um, but the actual connection is going back to Tokyo or somewhere, anywhere, um, because it's across the GSM network. Um, and, of course, he's paying for it because he made the call. So. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, he will have a record that he made a call to um, my throwaway uh, pay-as-you-go phone, yeah. So um, you would have to take care to obfuscate your, your phone number, yeah. So what you see here is an application I used for the CBIT and also for several TV demonstrations. So you were nice and switched on your Bluetooth. So what you see here is basically a listing of all the Bluetooth devices. On the left, there's a manufacturer which is guessed from the, from the MAC address or the hardware address of the phone. So sometimes I don't have an entry, but mostly it's Nokia, at least in Europe. We have some strange, I never saw TCOM so far iPads are here. You know, you, you get pretty much guess which device is vulnerable by having the manufacturer. And sometimes, in this case, the T610, we know it's sometimes vulnerable. Didn't even change the name. So this is still set to the default, and you could pretty much guess it's vulnerable. So on the red side of, uh, on the right hand side of this uh, table, there's a red dot. The application is not set to attack any of this device of these devices now because of legal issues. So what usually happens is that it turns green, uh, this spot. And if it turned green, we would have gotten an SMS from this phone, including the number and the phone book of the respective device. And not only the SIM and the, and the telecom, uh, the, the phone device phone book, but also the dialed contacts, missed calls, and stuff like that, which is pretty interesting to know, you know, who who did the person call last? That would be kind of interesting for any spouses to know. <laughs> well, 
We try the blue bug once more. Somebody connected again. <laughs> I switch Bluetooth off better. <laughs> oh. Okay, we have to skip that demonstration. We're sorry. But yesterday, and all the people who attended Black Hat would know <laughs> it worked. <laughs> anyway. That was the demonstration part. There's a question. When the phone is turned off and the battery is still in, I don't believe it's vulnerable because the Bluetooth stack is part of the operating system which has to be up at the time of the attack. So I don't believe it's vulnerable at that point. Doesn't make sense. Uh, we're not going to share that at this time um, until the, the phone companies have actually got a mechanism for dealing with the issue, uh, which Nokia announced last week that they are actually rolling out an upgrade program where you'll be able to walk in and um, uh, get your firmware upgraded. Uh, what well, models uh, are affected? If you go to the bluesnaf.org oh. site, you'll find uh, a list of models there. Uh, by the um, way, the presentation is not done. Maybe we shift the questions to the end. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if we move on. So the, the potential attacks you've got with uh, the um, calling, the voice calls, you can call premium rates um, you don't care where the voice is going, you just want to establish a call, initiate a call from the phone and you're charging per minute for the outgoing call. Um, in the UK at least, the, the um, costs per minute are completely open-ended, there is no regulation. Um, you can set up a company that charges £10 for the, the first second of the call and, and that will uh, be charged to your bill. Uh, and you only need access, as I say, for the initial call setup. You don't have to stick around because you don't care where the voice is going. Um, long distance calls, you do need the, the voice channel. Basically, uh, you want to use somebody else's phone to make a phone call yourself, so you need the voice channel. So uh, if you're doing it by uh, hijacking the voice channel over Bluetooth, you basically need to act as a headset. Uh, so you have to stay within range. The alternative is you set up a, a call forward so that the, the phone you're calling actually calls the number you want when you dial it um, and connects you onwards. Uh, and that's only worth doing if your local call is cheaper than the long distance, which it probably is. And if you're on a network where you get free calls uh, in the evening, whatever, then that call for you will be free. Uh, you can listen to voicemail because... Um, most voicemail systems accept the uh, CLI of the incoming call as authentication. It doesn't require a PIN if it recognizes the incoming call. So if I use Bluetooth to connect to the phone and then dial your voicemail, it will just send me straight into voicemail and I'll hear your messages, can delete your messages and so on. Um, with SMS, you've got, uh, again, the same problem with premium rate. You can send messages to uh, cost per drop. Uh, systems where you actually just send it a message and it charges you. Um, you could potentially use the phone as a spam gateway, so you're sending unsolicited SMS spam um, from someone else's phone. You can impersonate the victim, so uh, a message arriving on someone else's phone appears to have come from you, so clearly, uh, or from that victim, uh, so they may act on that um, message because they, they feel it's authenticated because of where it's come from. And probably one of the most um, scary is that the uh, authentication, access to authentication secrets or being able to actually complete a, an authentication process. In the UK we have some services where you can type a phone number into a website and it will then track that phone uh, wherever you go and it, you can look it up any time, day or night and if that phone is switched on it will draw you a nice little map and show you where the phone is. Um, 
And the way they authenticate is you type in the number, they send a text message to the phone, you respond from the phone with another text message to their center, and then you're in. So if I can connect by Bluetooth to your phone, I can actually complete that process for you. Uh, and this is one I did earlier. So I don't know how good the, uh, the writing is, but basically they, the, for the civilian market, they reduce the accuracy down to about 800 meters. Um, and if you can see just by the vertical bar where the avenue is, uh, there's a little number one, and that's where it thought I was. Where I actually was is just up above the, the tube station at Turnham Green where there's a little cross. That distance is about 100 meters. So it's much more accurate than it, it claims to be, and that's certainly close enough that you could then drive to that location and find me with Bluetooth. Okay, so other potential losses are service theft using the, the phone as a gateway to um, dial into the, the internet. Or, as I said, uh, with the um, perimeters, if you have a properly set up network that authenticates incoming calls uh, with CLI, then I can bypass at least that first stage of authentication because I'm coming in from a recognized number, uh, which I found in your phone book, of course. Um, GPRS, just again, another kind of gateway, free internet and potentially could be used as an endpoint for, for cracking or spamming. Okay, so we found these problems and we posted uh, to the, the industry, and the first way we did that was we posted to the Bluetooth SIG on the technical website, they actually have a security expert group. Um, and they have a, a forum where you can just go and post messages. So I posted a message describing the outline and I expected uh, various phone manufacturers to get in touch and find out what the problem was. A couple of weeks later, nothing had happened. And I looked back at the forum and basically anyone else who'd posted had also had no response whatsoever. There were no replies in, in the forums to any of the messages or issues that people had raised. So we posted to BugTrack. Within 24 hours, Nokia got in touch uh, and their Chief of Security basically discussed the issue with us. We shared the, the code with them. They reproduced the problem in their labs. They verified that it was uh, a real problem, and management decided that uh, they weren't going to do anything about it because it only affected a few models of phone. Um, we'll come on to that later. TDK um, published a very long, rambling explanation of why we were wrong, and this couldn't possibly happen. Um, Sony Ericsson uh, released a press release saying they had fixed the problems. When we tried to get in touch with them, they actually refused to talk to us. We emailed them, we phoned them, we wrote to them. The only response we ever got was a letter saying, we have our own security department, thanks very much and good night. Um, six months on, they were still taking that stance uh, and publishing, uh, you know, in response to any press that came along, they were publishing that they had fixed the problems, but they had never spoken to us, so I'm not sure how they could be sure they'd fixed the problems. When I finally got through to someone and suggested that they actually send me a phone so that I could test it, because you know we're working on old phones with older firmware at six months on, um, they said if I want to test it, I should go to a shop and buy one. So yeah, like I need a broken phone. Um, so they then got the idea that maybe there was a, a further problem and they finally allowed me to uh, tell them what the problem was and sure enough they hadn't fixed it, they'd fixed Martin's problem but not mine. So phones were still vulnerable and they, uh, when they believed they had actually corrected the issue. Um, Siemens and Motorola on the other hand uh, came to us unsolicited, we hadn't looked at their devices, we hadn't reported any problems with their devices, they came along and, and said, you know, here are some new Bluetooth phones we're about to launch, um, can you have a look at them, tell us if there's any issues. Um, Siemens came up clean, Motorola V600 um, actually established that something we believed may be true, which was uh, an escalation of privilege attack using one um, profile to attack another. Um, was possible, and so we combined our attacks and actually managed to get into the Motorola. So they, the industry then responded with a bunch of defenses as to why this really wasn't an issue, um, they, and they cited these things, distance, limited number of models, that it's an implementation issue, it's not an issue with Bluetooth per se. You need specialist equipment, you're going to look really suspicious doing it. 
devices aren't vulnerable anyway. Um, you can change the name, and then we won't be able to attack you because we won't know you're vulnerable. Um, it's easier to steal or find a phone, and it's far-fetched and, and low risk. So distance, the actual uh, published distance of Bluetooth is 10 meters, so we have to be close. Well, 10 meters is 30 feet. You know, that's from me here to these guys here, um, to you probably, yes. And it's a sphere. It goes all around me, behind me, beside me, above me, below me. So if I'm sitting in a bus, I've got everyone on the bus. If I'm in an office building, I've got people on the floor above and the floor below. And in practice, actually, just with a normal dongle, uh, you get a range of about 40 meters. Um, I, what I found with a class one device, I get a range of about 90 meters. Um, now this gentleman sitting here from um, Flexilis, they have a really cool toy with them, which is a Bluetooth sniper rifle. And you uh, do you have it with you? Okay, well, they're getting a range of half a mile pointing at a normal phone, and they've done um, copies of data from a phone half a mile away by pointing this device at. Um, so, yeah, see, get a look at that if you can. It's really cool. Okay, so limited number of models. Well, yeah, I put my hands up here. They were right. There, there are only a limited number of models affected. Unfortunately, they are by far the most popular models on the market. <laughs> if you go out in London, 70% of all the phones you see will be one of these models. Um, the Nokia 6310 and 8910 series are the standard businessman's phone. So, you know, corporate contracts will have thousands of these things. Um, Sony Ericsson T610 is the, the sort of trendy lifestyle phone. So, you know, those two models are pretty much the, the main models on the market. As far as implementation issues go, you know, you don't care whether it's Bluetooth is the problem or, or it's the, the actual implementation on that model of phone. Um, and in fact, uh, at stake have probably found some fundamental flaws which would um, lay a lot more devices open to attack anyway. And there's more detail on their website. That we need specialist equipment, uh, you know, advanced knowledge of Bluetooth technology. Well, again, that's not the case. We used black box research. We didn't know anything about Bluetooth when we started. We just poked around with the protocols that were available, information we could find on the internet. Standard laptop, generic dongles, which you can see um, on the table. Um, software stacks downloaded from the internet and slightly modified. and. Uh, even if you know this is all too bulky in theory, there is software available on PDAs and, and mobile phones um, in development. But in practice, you know, you just have a, a laptop in a bag. That's fine. So yeah, which brings us on to suspicious behaviour. I can do it from my laptop in the bag, hung over my shoulder, reading a newspaper. In fact, I entered the Houses of Parliament, went through the security handed in all my crap, they sent it through the x-ray machine, they searched me, they let me in, I spent 15 minutes walking around with my bag over my shoulder looking at the nice paintings and the statues and seeing some um, MPs milling around and I left um, and that, the attack was running all the time I was in there. Um, not actually attacking of course, just gathering statistics. <laughs> Um, devices are not always in vulnerable mode. Well, they have to be discoverable. That's not necessarily true. Some devices are actually vulnerable to attack even if they're not discoverable, if you know their, their MAC address or BD address. 